Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Jody Hammer, and I'm going to be hosting this webinar on crafting a resume for fellowships and funding, because a lot of our returning Peace Corps volunteers want to go to grad school, and they're applying for competitive fellowships and, and other scholarships and such. So, uh, and it is quite different. So we're going to really be talking about how it's different, and how you can craft the best uh, application possible. So let's go ahead and get started. So what is a CV? Does anyone know what CV stands for? I'll give you a hint, it's Latin. Uh, curriculum vitae. Vita, yes, like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Joelle, it, it looked like you were maybe going to say the same thing. So excellent. You know, your, your Latin or what it what it means. What so so do you know what it actually means like the words. This is a bonus question <laughs> far and beyond. It's it, it's um it's actually it's it's course of life. Your, your course of your curriculum vitae, it's kind of like your story, right? Your course of, of um, in life. And so it, another way, and I like how um, another source uh, explains it as everything that qualifies you as an expert in your field. That's what a curriculum vitae or CV, we call it for short, um, is. So that sounds pretty daunting, I know, right? Everything that qualifies you as an expert you know, sometimes you may not feel like an expert when you're applying for a fellowship or things like that, but it's everything that makes you an excellent candidate, right? So uh, another way to think of it is to think about, you know, your achievements, right? Your significant achievements over the course of your life, your career achievements. And so those have to do with everything from education, which we'll talk about later, right? And employment. So in the education, where you went to school, what was the degree you got, right? Scholarships you might've gotten are really important when you're applying for you know, fellowships, showing them that, hey, I've been awarded things in the past when that's applicable, right? Uh, and then employment, what, were you, what was your professional, uh, you know, professional experience? What jobs have you held? What skills have you gained from those jobs that are pertinent to this fellowship that you're going for? Great. Uh, research, research you've done. This is really big in the CV and it's really not even present generally in a resume, right? Your resume is much more about your like work experience and your skill set, you know, and, and uh, but, but research is not always a part of jobs, right? But in academia, it's a very large part in, in many fellowships and, you know, certainly, you know, scholarships and things like that. So um, all of that. Publications, if you've had things published, which you could include on a resume as well. I, I, I encourage people to do that, you know, at the end, maybe to have a category that might be, you know, other significant achievements or, you know, awards and, you know, whatever. And you could put that um, down there. Or if you were freelance, maybe you list that in your employment area. But in general, publications are oftentimes uh, more expected in graduate school applications when you're when you're applying or you know you're applying for some kind of a scholarship or fellowship within that um, they want to see your research experience and then our publications as well as your research uh, and then presentations as well you know if you've done presentations sometimes in your jobs you've done it might be a bullet in your regular resume you know um, planned prepared and delivered a you know present an educational presentation for a whatever student body of however many people on whatever topic so like you know you might have things like that um, in your resume but really you know presentations can be a big part of um, winning maybe like you know fellowships and scholarships things like that I liked this graphic and I actually have several graphics that I'm including and because I it was hard to choose which to include because they really are there's some there's some good ones here. Uh, so what's the difference? A lot of people and this by this, I mean, a lot of employers are actually using the term CV when really what they want and what they expect is a resume. But in their mind, they see it as, oh, it's the hip new term for a resume. So we'll just say, please send CV and cover letter to, you know, whatever. And in, in truth, a CV really is not the same whatsoever as a resume. It's, it's quite different. And so these are some of the differences that are outlined. And then a couple of the other slides will, will have some differences as well. So 
your resume, as I said a little bit earlier, you know, really emphasizes your experience, your skills, right, that you have, right? Whereas your CV is, is emphasizing a lot, it's going to include some of your work, right, and your skills and such, but it's really going to focus a lot on academia because that's where you use a CV, right? You, you generally, in the States, you use a a CV when you're applying for graduate school or whatever, an educational institution type of right job um, or studies, scholarships, things like that. And you also use a CV pretty much around the world outside of the United States, right? But the United States, for whatever reason, we are very much into this resume for everything but academia almost, right? So you can see here where it says, you know, a resume is used when you're applying for whether it's, you know, it could be nonprofit, for profit, right? You know, public sector. Um, you know, uh, yeah. So, so your federal types of jobs, although those resumes are a bit unique because they have more information even included, so they're longer. But uh, resumes by nature are really, you know, no more. I mean, they're they're generally no longer than two pages, right? Now, on occasion, you'll get maybe a senior level position that somebody's applying for, and they want you to prove that you have you know, 15 years of experience in XYZ plus this, and that's going to take more than a page, right? Um, oftentimes we try to have people fit it if they can, their highlights, because you don't have to go back to the beginning of your career. You know, we understand, you know, you get 20 years out, you probably aren't going to be putting your jobs from 20 years ago on your resume, which is a bummer when you served in Peace Corps like me very long ago. But alas, you can get it in there in a different way. You could put your, your Peace Corps service, for example, under a separate category that might be titled, you know, international service and, you know, something, you know, or and community service or international service um, or, and, and leadership or something like that. And you could have your Peace Corps service under there instead. Um, whereas, you know, wh what I was saying with the CV, it really, I mean, it depends on how much experience you have, how long your CV is going to be, but it's more generally more accepted that it could be over two pages. And that's not a problem unless they specify in the fellowship application directions. And this is where we get to read all directions and follow them. Because if they say, and there are more and more, you know, institutions that are going with, let's do a two page limit. If they say that and you turn in a CV that's four pages, that's going to scream at them. I did, I have nothing, you know, like I, I didn't, didn't read the direct or I didn't pay attention to the directions. That's not the kind of person they want to hire. So you really, you do want to follow the directions first and foremost. Right. Um, and as I said, the CV, you know, applying for an academia fellowships, grants, all of those. So um, you, you will definitely have as well, like, you know, um, when you have a resume, I'm a big believer of starting with your experience, your professional experience. Well, first your header, right? Even on, on a resume too, right? Your header, of course, is the same for both. And then, you know, you might have key qualifications, you might call it, or summary of qualifications or something that's like a little profile of yourself, what you bring overall, right? And then go right into the professional experience. Because here's what happens when this here says, after one year of industry experience, so one year out, then you want to definitely change the experience to be before your education, unless you're doing a CV for an academia. Whenever you're doing a CV or for academia, you know, where you're trying to get a fellowship or going to school, you want to have your education first and foremost, really up there. You might have some of your little profile or something, but then your, your education is going to be before your experience. The reason that I recommend flipping that when you're doing a standard resume is to avoid the perception of them glancing at it and assuming, we know what that means, right? <laughs> um, assuming that you're a new grad, no experience, because anyone who puts their education first is clearly a new graduate, because that's screaming, this is the most important thing about me, right? And that's how, you know, universities will sell this, you know, they'll say, oh, yeah, education first when you're first coming out. I used to work in the career center, actually, in, in the educational, you know, uh, an institution. And so I, I understand that, um, yes, that might be the case for some people, if that is the best thing that they bring forward right away. But it's also free advertising for employ for the institution, like, hey, look at our great candidate. They went to our university and that gets right up there. So there are many times where I recommend that you actually do your professional experience before in a regular resume, right? 
So, but that's very different than in a CV. In a CV, you're going to always begin with the education ask, right? That header, right? And you're going to, um, you're going to include things like what your, if you did a dissertation or your thesis or anything like that, right? Um, including, the, they recommend here, including even the name of the advisor, right? Um, when you were doing that. So, so it's, it's definitely very, um, it, it's very helpful for them to, to have that. And they really want to document kind of and see you having documented your educational background and experience. So you really want to make that impressive, as impressive as possible. Okay. Any questions so far? I know I've kind of been. If there's any questions you have, definitely put them in um, into the, the chat box. Okay, so somebody is here, let's see, currently accepted into a doctor PhD program. Wow, Maria, congratulations. That's awesome, yes. Um, so you're accepted into that beginning 2021 and you're looking forward to learning about funding. Yep, you can tap into. Where are you uh, accepted, uh, Maria? Do you mind sharing what institution? The only reason I ask is um, one thing I would definitely recommend that you do is check with your institution on what kinds of fellowships, funding, scholarships. Most universities have a um, most universities have a department, or at least part of a department that's dedicated to fellowships or you know financial you know like um, fellowships and and um, you know scholarships things like that. Sometimes it's partnered with another area like for example they might have and community community service or something like that it might be like that's under the same umbrella but they should have some resources most institutions will um, that you can find out about university specific types of you know funding assistance scholarships that might be available either when you're first applying or maybe it's for like after a year you know you prove yourself and there's you know or whatever um, there might be additional. So, so definitely look at that. And I'm going to go over in the end as well. Um, I have a listing of a few great resources that are online, free online resources to find out what kind of, they have huge databases, right, um, of different scholarships and different, you know, funding for you to really tap into. So, um, and, and, you know, with that kind of a thing, what's great is, you know, unlike, um, you know, there, there's, for example, but when it's a fellowship or it's something that people, you know, they've granted, they've set up, set up a fellowship or set up, you know, a scholarship or whatever, they can have that be for whatever population they want. So the person that's setting it up, they may, you know, have been born in Minnesota. And so it's available to all, you know, current and former Minnesota residents. And it could even be as specialized as from Winona, Minnesota. I mean, it could be anything, right? So you, you can usually in these databases kind of enter your data where you're from and then they can help you sort through, oh, you might not have even known that there was a you know scholarship for someone like me from this place or you know whatever. So um, so yeah, definitely look at look at those. So Florida, okay, great, wonderful. So so FAMU, um, great and Rutgers, nice. Oh, that's great. So Definitely, um, I'm pretty sure Rutgers has one, and I would imagine that the other, the FAMU, would also um, have a department that's on that to help people, you know, access. Do a little bit of Google searching. I mean, that's always your your biggest friend, right? You know, best source, best online source for you know free. Um, you know, resources on fellowships or scholarships or whatever, and um, you'll find a lot. There's um, there's a, there's an organization that, gosh, it was the Center for Nonprofit. Basically, it, it exists to help nonprofits find funding for their institution. And so they sell their directory at a pretty reasonable price. And, and, and a lot of nonprofits use that directory to tap into this whole wealth of, you know, whatever um, resources that are available. But they are also committed, or they used to be at least, in part to helping the person looking to expand their, you know, to, to go to graduate school. So fellowships, that kind of thing. And they used to do a free webinar on like how to find, you know, um, some of the, you know, how to find resources on, you know, in, in fellowships that you might, you know, qualify for. So I'm just, I'm blanking on the organization, but it's like the Center for Foundation, um, 
this it, it's something the name is something that the center for foundation if you if you are interested email me and i will i will um reply to you but if you do a google search even on you know foundation um the foundation center that's what it is the foundation center um and maybe uh joelle would you mind putting maybe the link to the um if you just do a google search on it foundation center um i think it might just be foundation center dot um or but i i don't remember so she'll put that in there um for you you and uh it really i mean that can be a great you know resource and we're gonna talk about some more at the end too so let's go on here and just see another graphic um i liked this one because it really kind of you know it, it, it's a nice the icons here you know studies you know the cv is more of that you know like for studies academia right so you know that's your audience right and that's what we're talking about more today right and so the length can be much more than you know the two pages we were talking about for the you know for the resume um reverse chronological order so the most recent you know first of course and then you know it's interesting you'll see different different advice right i was looking at there's um and it's in the resources that i was going to share with all of you um dr karen um the article is like dr karen's you know uh, advice for, um, you know, for the curriculum vitae and, and that type of thing, you'll, and you'll see this, but uh, when you get your follow-up from me, but she is very, um, she, her personal view, she's like, don't use bullets. And that's gonna be one of those things where you're gonna talk to some people and they'll say bullets like me. I would much rather read bullets and scan through with bullets than looking at sh even short paragraphs, right? What they'll say instead is do very short paragraphs that are just, you know, the sentences together and then a blank line, whatever, and then sentences together. But to me, I just get lost in that. And so that, that some of the advice that you're going to get from people, you know, when you talk to different, you know, different people who maybe, you know, have gotten some scholarships in the past and you want to talk to them and do a career chat, which is great, a great idea, right? They're going to have their own opinions. So it's not always going to maybe mesh with what I'm saying here today or what Dr. Karen says or, you know, um, others. So you, you, each person does have, but in general, I'm trying to go over the kind of industry standard, right? And and I hear both ways on the bullet. So you could kind of go both both ways there. I don't think that you'd be, you would be overlooked because you used bullets, certainly, right? Um, you know, they're, they're easy to read and all of that. And then again, back to the traditional resume, you know, more of your experience, right? And that non-academic, we've gone through most of that. So um, various, you know, many different, you know, font sizes, all of those kinds of things are, are different there. But um, here, this one I really like because it gives you a little more structure and, and uh, you know, look at what it might look like, right? So here on the left, right, you have like a resume. And a lot of times resumes now are using both of the like two columns going down instead of just the, the, the one on the right you notice has the, it's going all the way over. That is more of a traditional one. And I oftentimes, you know, recommend that and people use it and they're successful with it. And that's fine. Today, there definitely are more people who are using some of the like fancy, there's, there's a lot of templates that are out there. Um, you want to be careful with templates because you want to make sure that they're going to be readable. Um, you know, if they have a computer scan it like an ATS applicant tracking system initially to see if you're qualified, they're looking for some of the keywords, that kind of thing. Um, but usually if you save it as a most of those application tracker system, you know, the ATS and such, most of them now can read a, a PDF. So um, so oftentimes people will save theirs as a PDF because then it doesn't change. This is the same for, for resume as it is for your, for your, um, curricula, your, your CV, because it will look exactly like you saved it. Have any of you ever applied for a job and you've pushed send and you had your word document and all of that, you had it looking so pretty and it perfectly fit the two pages or the one page or whatever you send it. And then you go back and you look at it and you open it, you know, from the attachment. And it comes out with like one line on the second page or two lines, like it went over, right? That's what can happen. And that's not great, right? So when you save it as a PDF, it prevents that from happening. It's just going to have it show exactly. Um, it's like a picture of it, right? Um, so here you can see on, you know, on the, the right here, more of the, you know, your name and, you know, you know, whatever your, your, your profile, your title, or your, maybe, you know, your information. Um, and this isn't intended for you to be able to see, to read this. It's more structurally to kind of just see it as a glance. Right. So, so up, you know, at the top, you're going to have like your contact information, right? You don't necessarily have to have your like street address anymore. Um, oftentimes, but if, you know, it, for education, it doesn't really matter because if you're going for a, a degree, 
unless you're doing an online program, which you may be doing, there's more and more of those, but um, it doesn't really matter where you're, where you're at right now. If we accept you into this program, you know, pre-COVID anyway, it was, and it will be someday where you'd be expected to basically, you'd be coming to that institution. So it's not as much. Sometimes with resumes, when you put your, where you're living now and you have the full, you know, address and all of that, it can be used against you in a sense. It's like, oh, well, they're in Cincinnati and, you know, this is, you know, DC and that's a long way away and, you know, whatever. So, um, so yeah, some people will, will not put their, they'll just have their, you know, add their, sorry, their email address and their, um, their phone number for sure, you have to have those, right? And maybe their face, uh, their, not, not Facebook, their uh, LinkedIn profile URL, the shortened one that you could shorten and, and have those on there um, as the, how to you know, contact you because you don't necessarily have to have you know, where you're coming from. If it's unique and you think it's going to help maybe in a way, maybe it sets you apart from the masses, that can be something to factor as well about putting your, you know, the full you know, address, it's fine. It's absolutely fine to have it um, in, in the CV. So good. Um, it showcases, yeah, really it showcases and you're going to have like categories, right? Your credentials. So you're going to have your education right up top. You see that the, the double line that's kind of under the name. That's just saying that's like <coughs> saved for what would be maybe a profile. I hate the word objective, whether you're doing a, a CV or a resume, I absolutely hate the word objective because honestly, let's think about it. Your objective is to get whatever you're going for, whether it's a job, you know, that job. So a lot of times it ended up being so like generic that it was like a rewarding position at, you know, at ABC company with opportunities for growth and advancement, like blah, right? Right. That's, that's so generic, right? So tell me more about you, what you bring. So I generally say to people instead, if you do, whether it's a profile or, or um, something where, you know, it might be, you know, bilingual professional with MPH and X years of blank, blank experience, something like that in your first, you know, upfront, they kind of get a, a feel for you, right? Or with proven, you know, expertise in da, 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 whatever it is. Now on this one, after that, you can see those are really like skills headers, like not headers, skills. Like you might have a listing of the skills. Obviously you would be tailoring these to the job, to not, not the job, the, the um, uh, fellowship that you're applying for or the scholarship. So you would definitely want to have those, the ones that they're talking about, you know, read again, read, reread, reread again, the, uh, the description of the fellowship, make sure that those are the kinds of skills that you're going to be working in, not just putting as a, as an entry up there, but anything that's there should be proven in your experience or your education, right? So that they're not just saying, oh, they're just putting what we want to see, what we want to hear. No, you need to actually prove that. So make sure you, you know, in, in one of your experiences, you know, you have a bullet that might be, you know, if it's, um, you know, demonstrated attention to detail and accuracy in blah, 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 or whatever, attention to detail and accurately tracking budget of X hundred thousand, whatever, um, when you're doing your, your bullets or your entry things to make sure that they get from your experience and your education as well what you're doing there. Um, so, so that's, that's really important as well. And your education, like I said, is going to be actually before your, um, before even your, um, your experience in the, in the CV. So that's how it's going to be in order. And then down below, you might have things like, you know, um, it could be, you know, specialized skill or specialized skills. If you didn't use that at top, you know, you might have, um, you know, it might be specialized skills and, um, you know, and leadership or, or leadership and community service might be a header itself for academia. You know, it might be, you know, research and I don't know what kind you're going for, but if there's like a research component, make sure you show any research that you have already done, whether it was for a, a paid job, an internship in your Peace Corps service, right? If you did, you know, whatever kind of, you know, um, analysis, you know, you're, PACA and you know some of those right your SWOT analysis any of those kinds of things like make sure you you get include those those kinds of um, skills and those kinds of examples of it to really make yourself more competitive does that make sense hopefully are there any questions coming in uh, Joelle I don't see any um, right now so I'll go on but if you do have I want to remind you if you do have uh, questions 
to please put them in the chat box and I'll get to them at the end of this. And, you know, time is time is going fast anyway. So um, this is just another, I like this layout. This is kind of more of your traditional, you know, um, resume or, you know, CV, right? Like this is in it. And so it has right where it says, you know, curriculum vitae, you would put there, you know, your name, right? Now I, I do, I know that some, some sources when you're, you know, looking online for advice on, you know, writing a CV for academia or for fellowships and things like that, you'll see some that will actually put the name and then underneath it, they'll put, you know, curricula, you know, CV, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll write out curriculum vitae. Now, I don't think you have, like with a, with a resume, I never recommend people put the word resume. Like that's going to be obvious. This is you, your key qualifications. You're not going to write that, but sometimes and again you know it depends maybe even on schools and stuff how they like so you'd want to maybe try to find people who've been in this program or ideally people that have had the scholarship or fellowship in the past you can do a lot of searching through linkedin for example and we're going to talk more about that actually on friday at our um, one o'clock session we're going to talk about using linkedin beyond the job search right so using it to connect with people, groups, or, you know, institutions like, you know, um, schools, things like that. So um, that can be, that could be helpful for you as well, just to know. Uh, so here, you know, this actually, it, it defines a little bit, but what I like about the, the layout here is that it's kind of like, you know, in the beginning, you might have where, you know, where the resume versus curriculum vitae, right, CV is, you know, you might have your, you know, you might have your profile or something right up there, and then your education, and then your, you know, you, you might, you would put your entries in your, you know, for example, your work entries, you know, that's how it might look is that what are the differences between resumes and CV, you have those bullets, you might have bullets, you know, in that, you know, in the CV or the short paragraphs with some space between. Um, again, I prefer the bullets, but that's, you know, that's, there's other preferences too. So, um, but what I, uh, what I like about like what to include when we're talking about down here, right? These are, these are the categories that they come up with, but there may be other things that you want to include or need to include or is appropriate, right? But I think this is a pretty comprehensive list, which is why I included it. Um, obviously your contact information we've already talked about, right? Your education, you know, your, the degrees that you have now, a lot will say, a lot of people will say, put you know, your um, degree first and then the institution, right? So if you're applying for grad school or, you know, a, you know, a fellowship, that kind of stuff, fine on a CV to have it that way, right? But anytime that you're applying for a job, I generally recommend to people to put the institution first, especially if you're competing for something that you may not have a master's in, but the job description says, you know, bachelor's required, master's preferred. If you put, you know, lead in with that bachelor's and it's like really obvious that you have bachelor's, you might not make it to the to be considered further pile, right? Because they have hundreds of people who are applying. And so they have in their mind, their little perfect candidate doesn't mean you have to have every single thing there, right? But you do need to reach the interview so that you can really wow them with your greatness and your RPCV savviness and your resourcefulness and all of that, right? Your resilience, uh, but you have to get there. So you've got to have a resume that's going to pique the interest. As we said earlier with the resume, the resume's purpose is to pique the interest of the employer so that they want to talk to you more. And then they're going to talk to you and get more information. So whereas in a CV, oftentimes you're, you know, it's, it's, you know, you might um, put, you know, your institution, you know, more and, and you might put the, even the, the degree that you have, and that's fine um, first, but your degree, the institution, the dates that you were there doesn't have to be the comprehensive date. It could be the date you were awarded like your bachelor's or your master's or whatever. It could be that, you know, month, year is fine. You don't have to put, you know, from this time to that time generally, right? Um, any any of the detail on like your dissertation, if you did one or your maybe senior thesis, you know, any of those kinds of honor things, those are really big in um, in academia. So people, they, they love to see those. So that's perfectly appropriate to include those there as well. Um, honors and awards, you know, for people when they're doing, whether it's a resume or a CV, I recommend oftentimes under, you know, as one of the bullets under their um, education, like their education listings. So whether it's, you know, MPH, you know, or whatever, you know, M, you know Master of Public Health and, and the, um, the, the school, right, um, or the date, whatever. And then the, but the, the, the 
putting your um, for honors and awards after you have your data about the school, right? The including the name of the institution, the um, the degree location, and you know, and the and the and the date you received it. On the next, like under that, you could put a bullet, and you could have honors and awards colon. And then you don't have to put for for regular like resumes. Oftentimes, I say to people, you know, you don't have to worry about having you know all of them listed in in a regular resume because they're going to get it. You're smart. I get it. Right. But in a CV, I think it's very accepted and appropriate to actually itemize and include. Um, it just helps you be a stronger candidate. Wow. This is somebody who was awarded for their, you know, awarded this, you know, whatever scholarship for X, Y, Z. So it's, it's, it's more appropriate to have that and it's fine to have a longer uh, entry there. Um, same with extracurricular activities. Um, I don't like to call it extracurricular activities generally. I like to put something like, um, un, if you're talking about within the, um, the header of, of education and you're listing down there and you had your honors and awards, um, you had uh, leadership, maybe it's leadership and community service, colon, and then you have those things just listed with semicolons in between. President, you know, whatever, student body, blah, blah, semicolon, and then whatever the, the next one is. So it, it saves a little bit of room because you don't want the CV to be extremely long either or longer than necessary, right? Um, and then, yeah, professional memberships appropriate as well, right? Especially when you're going into certain fields. I think that's, you know, very expected maybe. And um, that could be something that you actually put at the end after your professional experience. And then the like, you know, professional memberships, you could have that as a category. Um, certainly under there. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, your computer skills, you know, and that could be, you know, anywhere from, I mean, I know people think that, oh, this is obvious, you know, everyone knows this, you know, whatever. It's still, I think, important to put things, you know, on there, like, you know, maybe it's, you know, to the degree to which you are, you know, highly, you know, highly skilled at or advanced proficiency in, you know, Microsoft Office, including Excel, da, 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 whatever, you know, if there's certain things that they're spotlighting, like pivot tables or whatever, make sure you include that if they're asking for it, right? Um, you know, stats, packages, all that kind of stuff can be under technical skills or computer and, you know, whatever, it could be language and computer, you know, whatever types of skills. So absolutely. Um, I already talked about professional experience, including more than just your paid work experience. It can be your internships, your, you know, any kind of consulting, um, you know, freelance, you know, writing, you know, maybe articles, things like that. Um, and then, of course, what, what's unique about CV, right, when, when you're doing, when you're going toward, when you're going for like a, a scholarship or a fellowship or whatever, you want to have information on like your, you know, your research interests and your proven, like what your experience has been, what your passion is, but it's really about describing, I, I, I heard, I, I heard once somebody talk about CVs and, and academia CVs and talking about how it's not so much about like why I'm so great. It, the view is why am I like the candidate to fill this spot in this fellowship to help you in, you know, in, in this, you know, whatever way, the research, that kind of thing. So it's just really keeping that in mind, right? Um, any teaching experience, especially if you're applying for like TA positions, of course, right? And let's remember most of us as Peace Corps volunteers taught in one way or another, whether it was a formalized I taught fifth grade, you know, or whatever, you know, or at the, you know, colegio, whatever, or it was informal where you were assisting and such, definitely put both of those styles, both of those types in, in your CV for, um, for that. Okay. And then publications are, are huge, right? I mean, obviously anytime you're published, that's like an honor or right. And that's something to be recognized. And it's great to be able to maybe even link to those or, you know, share those maybe as a follow-up if they want, you know, or be able to, you know, look at that. Um, so they can look at the article that you, that you published. Um, yeah, manuscripts, all that kind of thing. And then same with presentations, right? I mean, presentations, a lot of us do presentations, right? In graduate school, a lot in, I mean, in your work, right? It depends on what kind of, of job you have, you know, and what kinds of presentations you do. So it might be like select presentations. It really depends on what, what fellowship you're going for, what you're going to emphasize more is what I guess I'm trying to say. But these are all things that you would um, pick, pick from, right? To include. Um, Yep, the, you know, references. Um, now, a lot of times references, it's interesting because yes, if you're going for a, you, again, follow their direction. If they say to include, 
the references, you know, um, in your, you know, CV, including references, you know, who they can talk to, absolutely do it. You know, sometimes you can't, I like to put it on a separate sheet labeled professional references for Jody Hammer or whatever, right? And then your, you know, your contact information. And then each of the, if it's three people and putting, you know, in bold their name and then in parentheses, it might be, or right in the next line, former supervisor, or just so that they have an, they have an idea of what was the relationship between you and this person you're putting down as a, because it's not always a former employer, right? It might be your, you know, TA, you know, it might be your, you know, uh, professor that was your, you know, uh, you know, your professor guide in some way or something like that. So uh, mentor, or whatever. So absolutely. Okay. So, um, and there's other things. I, I don't know if you have uh, comments, you know, are there, is there anything else that you have included or thought to include that you don't see on this list? And if so, please either just dump it in the chat box or just unmute yourself. And uh, if you're watching this recording, uh, you're not going to do that. But, but for those who are in the live recording of the session, um, anything else that you would want to include or have questions about including in a CV for, a, for like a fellowship or um, scholarship? All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna go yeah. ahead and what? Yes. I have yes. one thing. I have a, a faculty member who I kind of mimic her curriculum by Tay. And for community service, I've split it out into a couple sections. Um, she uh -huh. had it that way. And so I had like local service, um, and then I had local outreach. And so because in research oh. we have like outreach projects, but then we have actual community service where we're doing a give back. Oh, that's great. Um, and then we also had like local service and then international service or something yep. like that. So, I know, think that's different. absolutely fine. I mean, and because you don't have the space limits as much with the CV, you know, with the regular resume, I would say, wow, that'd be really tough to do as separate ones, headers, because you'd be using more space. But yeah, with the CV, it's not as important, you know, in general. If you are, however, trying to stay within whatever stated guidelines or, you know, requirements, you know, maybe instead of having those separate, you could have, you know, you know, uh, domestic and international service and, and they'd be able to tell by the entries. I mean, that would be an, an option, but I think that sounds great. It sounds like you, you know, looked at your mentor and, and are doing what, yeah, what she did. That's great. Awesome. Anyone else? Anything you thought about including or you um, you think you might need to include? Uh, for references, uh, yep. like before we put it in like the CV, do we have to request for like permission or something? So, yeah. That's a great question. And yes, I always recommend if you're going to be putting it in it, before you share their name, you want to get their permission. And so now does that mean every single time you're, you know, like having to ask for permission? No, generally they'll give you permission, but out of courtesy, you would want to anytime that you are, you know, if you're like applying for graduate school, you're, you know, you'd say, Hey, I'm applying for these fellowships and such. And as, as such, they do want, you know, the, the reference, thank you so much for your willingness to serve as a reference. Um, you know, would you, you know, I, I, commit to letting you know every time I put in an application, I will certainly let you know if it's a specific fellowship, what they're looking for in particular, and because just make it easy for them. So when you send that follow-up where you attach your full resume, but you specifically have outlined like, you know, related experience, this main things they're looking for this so that they can just glance at that. You're making their life super easy. If you just say, oh yeah, this is what I'm applying for. Then they're like, oh wait, what do they want? I don't know what I should be emphasizing. Like, you know, it's kind of a cheat sheet if you do it, um, if you let them know that kind of a thing. And I always say the same thing with, um, with even, you know, regular job, you know, references, get their, their, their um, authorization and then just be very professional to always let them know just that you just wanted to give you a heads up. They may be calling, you know, um, and that it's usually they're not going to, Oftentimes they're not going to call them in a job one. They're not going to call them until they've talked to you to see if you're among the select candidates, right? Because if you're like their highest candidate after they interview you, yes, we want to talk to your references. But do we want to talk to references of all five applicants that we're going to bring in for an interview? No, we're going to see from the interview which ones rise to the top. It's all about, right, saving work, saving time. I mean, we don't have time. People don't have time for, you know, all of that. So, um, so think about that as well. 
and, and just get their, get their authorization and then stay in touch. And once you get it, let them know. Say, thank you so much. Send them a huge thank you. Thank you so much for your help. I'm excited to inform you. I've been awarded X, Y, Z, you know, this, you know, um, th this scholarship, and I'm really excited to begin it. Thanks in part to you for you know, serving as a reference. And I look forward to staying in touch and then do it. Stay in touch. Don't lose touch. Don't be one of those phantom ghost, like where you ask for the reference and they give it to you. And then you're doing something for two years. And you're on your own. You never talk to them or anything. You never like let them know what's going on or anything. And then suddenly, oh, hey, I'm looking to do a job search. Would you still be a reference for me? That just, you want to avoid that if possible. So, and I noticed that someone has their hand up here, Dimitri. Um, so I want to call on you and see, did you have something uh, to, to add or a question? A question. So for skills and things like that, um, like I'm looking at computer skills and language competencies. And so if it's a skills, for example, I've, at a point, I was really great with statistical packages like safe, right. safe and fast. But once I'm once you're out of practice, I'm wondering, oh yeah, since this is like your, you know, the course of your life, at a point I knew how to do this. Do you still include it? Or like same thing for Kenya Rwanda from being in Rwanda at a point, I knew the language. Now right. it's kind of iffy. So it's like, do you still include those as your history? Or you not can. not if they're not I, I, relevant? I think what I might do is you know, maybe for, you know, sometimes when I was talking about like the, what was your proficiency? What was the level of proficiency? So is it, you know, um, is it, you know, basic, you know, whatever level or, or stats, you know, if it's, if it's been some time ago, you know, maybe it's, you know, you have the year or, or whatever showing, you know, if it's statistics, you know, whatever, but the other thing that you can do to help yourself is start to, to brush up on those stats things, go back and review or go to, there's so many online sources where you can like, you know, review stats, review, like online, you know, stats for dummies, or, you know, just like the, the, the basic where they really, 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 you know, break it down. I didn't have stats. So like, I am wowed by anyone. It's like, oh yes. Yeah. You're great. You have stats. Like I didn't ever have that. And, and so, but, but going, I could certainly go online and get trained in somewhat stats too. You know what I mean? So I bet you that when you go back and you start to refresh it, some of it will come back, but you know, you're not saying expert proficiency in right. You know, background, maybe, maybe instead of expert proficiency, it's background in statistics, you know, stats or, you know, in, in basic stats or something like that. Um, you know, you're, you're not saying, you know, advanced proficiency necessarily, but if you have advanced proficiency in other things, well, by all means put it so you can kind of itemize between. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. It was more, um, that's helpful. Cause I'm like, if I kind of knew, if I knew it pretty good, but not right now, what should I do? And you know, right. but brushing up makes sense. If yeah, time, you know, now so. you have the time, right? This is when you're doing the, you know, like, hello, a lot of people are like, gosh, you know, I mean, yes, the job search can take, you know, a long time if they're doing that or, or they're, they're trying to get a fellowship or whatever can take quite a bit of time. But then it's like, okay, how can I make myself more competitive or what can I do in the, in the process, you know, of, you know, a job search or this or that to try to, you know, like, uh, you know, gain some other technical skills that it seems are needed in my line of work. And there's so many different ones, right? So great. Awesome. Thanks, Dimitri, for that question. So a couple of things, since we have a few minutes here, um, packing a punch with your resume or your CV. And this is adapted from a slide that I used um, before when I was doing, you know, writing your resume. And, I, and I've adapted it actually to CVs because so much, like I said, is the same or is very similar, but it's just, there's a little bit different language. So with the, looking at your fellowship description, that's what, what they consider an ideal candidate. So if you read that and it's looking at what they're looking for, required and desired and whatever, that's what their ideal candidate is. So guess what? You, number one, need to look at yourself and say, okay, do I fit within that? Now, it doesn't mean that you have to have everything that they're looking for in general, unless there's some things that are like required, this, 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 desired, that, that, that. If you're not, you know, you know, qualified for it, they may, they may not consider you. But, but in terms of like possessing all of the things that they want in that description, you know, that's that's their ideal candidate. So your job is going to be really to look at your resume or your cover letter and really tailor it to that. That's what they want. Your job is to sell them or get them to consider you as somebody that is, you know, that would contribute positively to whatever the, you know, work that they have, right? The fellowship, the whatever. 
Um, so yeah, and so obviously using the terminology that they use to really make it you know applicable to them, right? Um, that said, I don't like to have if it's manage. You know, I, I wouldn't want to have somebody have managed, managed, managed like three times in their resume. That's like, right, you know, close. No, think of a synonym, right? Managed. What, what's another synonym? What's a synonym for managed? Anyone? There's many words. Managed. I'll give you a few. Directed. Moderated. Yep. Led. Facilitated. Oversaw. There's lots of different words for, right, for supervised or managed. So you can, you can kind of, you know, swap it up to some degree, but you want to have probably use more the word that they're using in their terminology, you know, in their description. And then include that skills category where you really have kind of some of those hard skills and those transferable skills and all those kinds of things. And um, quantifying, and when I say quantify, I mean, it, you know, people, people, like if, if they say, you know, designed or, 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 you know, trained, trained, um, trained rural health educators on the importance of, you know, nutrition and whatever. Right. And that's very, that's like of what you did, but there's no like numbers to make it punchy. It might be like designed, developed, you know, or, or designed, developed and trained a uh, team of 27 rural health educators on concepts related to da, 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 resulting in whatever the outcome, right? If, I, if you can, you don't always have those numbers, you know, um, but, you know, resulting in a 15% increase in, you know, anytime you have those numbers, put them in. And a lot of times you have more numbers than you think, you know, when I'm working with people on their resumes, you know, and they say, well, yeah, I taught English. Or I taught this, you know, and, well, how many students? Oh, how many? So wait, so in the, you know, how many were there total? Like that can be impressive, right? Putting those kinds of things down there as, as numbers, just it, it proves what you're saying, right? It makes a numbers pop. So that's applicable too for, for CVs. Um, using you know, the active voice, yeah, exactly. And, and you know, the ED action verbs is what we talk about. And I think I have a slide on that, right? So whether it's monitored, you know, delivered, it's, you know, the, the, you know, the ED action verbs, um, you don't use I, I developed, nope, not on, not on a resume. And even on a CV, I don't recommend it. I see some that have it, but, um, <coughs> but, you know, it, it, if you see the style that they're, they're wanting and they, they include it as the first, whatever, then feel free to use it. But in general, I would say not to use, um, and it can be fragments. It doesn't have to be full sentences, right? Um, that allows you to get more in with less time. And then, you know, save, you know, save it in the style that they, you know, request. If they want you to send it as a PDF, do it right? It's very easy to do. Save as and then change it to PDF, you know, or dot doc if it's, you know, word they want you to save it, whatever. So um, follow another, and that goes with the following directions. Questions on this one as I go, I'm going to go to the next one. And if you just so you can see the star methodology that, you know, um, this is just an outline of where it talks about, you know, your situation, task, action, and the results. So if you're trying to come up with a bullet to describe something that you did, right? So um, in this, in this example, in the accomplishment, right, they maybe came out with, you know, that organized business fraternity philanthropic events, which resulted in contributions exceeding $4,000, right? So, um, you know, you, you, you're getting this in, you know, like, like they might be, you know, served as, and then I don't know what, what the, what the role was there. It doesn't say, but maybe it served as finance director or finance chair, you know, comma, you know, responsible for you know, organizing X number of charity events, you know, contributing to, you know, $4,000 raised or something like that. Um, so that you can get those things in there. That's just an example to, to kind of show you, right? Um, and then again, just, you know, the power of words, you know, and this is so true for both resumes and for, for CVs. The action verbs, like we said here, accomplished, designed, you know, and, and tailor it to the company values, or in this case, the, the institution values and and what they specifically share right and there's lots of lots of um, examples over here on the left as well so um this is yeah it's all just you know using using the um using the words that are you know key avoiding ones that are kind of uh, overused if you will and there's going to be there's going to be um different thoughts on words like passionate 
you know, or, or demonstrate, you know, passion, passionate. Sometimes people are like, oh, that's not appropriate for a, you know, a word. But I think it depends on, I think it's certainly something that can be incorporated into a cover letter or your like, you know, personal statement that oftentimes goes with your CV, right? For these fellowships. And that's a whole different, you know, can of worms. But, you know, the personal statement, you know, developing, you know, that and, and, you know, you might put, you know, I, you know, my interest in this stems from my firsthand da, 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 da experience as a whatever, you know, and you go into your example, whatever it was where, you know, you were first introduced to, you know, this company or the, you know, the values or something like that. And you could certainly use those words, you know, if they're um, try to use the words that they use and that they, you know, without just parroting what they say, trying to, you know, come up with and, and, and return those. So, um, Dimitri, did you have another question or was it just your, yours was, um, still up? It's fine. Either way. Questions. I just need to put my hand down. <laughs> no, no problem. No problem. I just didn't know if you had another one. I didn't see if it went down. In the oh, That's absolutely no, no, fine. No, no. no problem. Any other questions from anyone else? Um, and then I want to just literally like share because we are at the hour here, but I do want to share with you just a little bonus of resources for finding and applying for fellowships. So for those of you who are looking for fellowships, as I said earlier, definitely check the universities that you're applying to. But honestly, there's a lot of great resources that are out there and information from some of the like Ivy League schools, for example, you know, um, Harvard or Princeton or whatever, that if you just do a Google on like, you know, how to find resources for finding fellowships, you know, graduate school, whatever, you're going to get a lot of the, the ping, a lot of the ones that are going to come back are going to be from educational institutions. Even if you're not applying to Harvard, you can take their great advice right and and apply to whatever you are applying for um, or wherever you are applying because that kind of thing is going to be you know generally um it, it would it would be applicable regardless so there's some really good information there but also profellow.com is a, is a group that i just learned about actually recently and it's um I mean, I learned more about recently, I should say, but um, they have like, if you, if you just go to their site and you look, they have, I believe it's a, it's a database and there's um, a lot of really good articles and like, you know, on, you know, how to determine, you know, what fellowships to apply for or what, you know, there's some really good resources that are related to this. Um, so I wanted to put that down as well as gograd.org. Have any of you heard of any of those resources before? Yes, um, I'm familiar. Sorry if I sound a little scratchy, guys. No problem. Sick. Um, but I have utilized um, Profello um, oh, for great. just like articles and kind of just staying on listservs and different things. Excellent. Um, and then also kind of use some of the tools of going to other institutions that yep. may have like um, a listserv that you can subscribe to. Yep. Um, it, it's really helpful. It's right. sometimes, sometimes uh, a lot of the scholarships I do receive, for example, um, I'm on one for University of Washington. Uh -huh. um, they will require that you're a resident sure. um, of, you know, the states um, on that side of the country. So that's been a little bit of a yep. barrier sometimes, but it's still sure. been a good uh, resource for some nationwide um, great. opportunities. Thank you so much, Mariah, for sharing your experience. I really appreciate that. Um, another question for you. On Profello, did you find that most of their like resources and tools to the database, that kind of thing, was free to access? Yes, um, I did notice that there was, sometimes it will prompt you um, to have like some, some other like paid. Um, yeah, there's like, a, I think there's a higher can... level, kind of like LinkedIn, right? Yeah, yeah, but I've I've just utilized it for the free level, yeah. so I'm not sure yeah. about the paid level. And honestly, generally, my thought on that is generally the free levels are fine. In fact, I think that even LinkedIn, which I'm going to talk about more, we're going to talk about more on Friday, um, the, the free basic level is just fine. And there's ways to kind of get around that system of like how they limit you for certain things. And um, and so it's, it's perfectly fine, right? You don't have to necessarily pay. And we don't have a lot of money, right? As RPCV is coming back and doing a job search and all of that. Like, I mean, you know, 39 bucks a month or I don't know what it is. It's, it's quite expensive. So um, that's great. I'm glad to hear that you have experience with that and um, and that it's positive. Um, are there other any other resources for finding and applying for fellowships that any of you all know? Um, you know, thank you, Mariah, for sharing. Anyone else have any other ideas that we could add to this list? That's fine. If not, I just thought you know you can you can go forth. That'll be your homework. 
You can go forth and you can find some more and then email me those at, you can always get me right at Jody at rpcv.org. Um, I'd love to add those to what we're doing, a compilation of different um, resources on a lot of different things, right? But in part, one of the kind of pillars is our education and professional development area. And we really wanna build that up to have more um, great content um, helpful because we wanna help get the word out to folks. And just to let you all know, um, we are always looking for ideas on additional topics that you want. So um, please let me know if you ever have, you know, a you know, a career topic or an education, you know, uh, professional development, you know, those, those are the webinars that we do every, every week. We do one of each um, and the podcast, please let us know. You can always, again, reach me at, you know, Jody at rpcv.org and, you know, put in, put in the subject line, you know, podcast or, or, you know, webinar topic, whatever. And I'd be happy to add that to our um, list. And I'm happy to take any other questions you have before you want to sign off. Okay. Thanks so much, everyone for being here.